good morning. You know, you're in Vegas when you walk across a bridge and somebody's cracking it truly at 9.15, right? Only in Vegas. Great to see you from your 15-day world tour. Yes. It's, uh, it's good to be back in the Pacific Standard or Daylight Time, time zone. Well, great to meet you. I'm looking forward to this conversation very much. So thanks, mm -hmm. thanks for your time in advance. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Got a few questions I'd love to start with, and at some point we're going to take a quick break and see a sizzle reel as well, so stay tuned for that. But to start, on, uh, there's so much hype around AI these days. How can marketing organizations embrace AI, AI to enhance productivity and creativity? Yeah, well, it's in, um, so Qualcomm, uh, we're in a unique position. It's sort of a duality where we actually develop and commercialize and enable AI um, at the edge and on device. So we're, we're developing the technology, but then as a CMO of a large enterprise, I'm thinking, how do I deploy AI tools to write, enhance the creativity process and to increase productivity amongst my team? And I think as an enterprise, sales and marketing is where AI is going to have a massive impact and the deployment of generative AI tools and, and things like that. So I look at it in two ways. As the CMO, if I wear my CMO hat, we're already deploying AI tools across my entire team. Um, we are an Adobe shop, uh, as I have reinvented and reimagined in my MarTech stack and our digital customer journey, I've deployed the entire Adobe suite, including Firefly. And we've just actually bought Firefly into our, our marketing process roadmap. So we're, we're starting to utilize and deploy Firefly across our creative process, which is super exciting. Uh, we've also been working with, with Writer. If, you, if I'm familiar with Writer, it's a generative AI tool that helps with copy development, product naming, things like that. Uh, we're exploring mid-journey uh, in the creative process. So we're using these AI tools to, again, enhance and accelerate the creative process, but also to increase productivity as the, the market and our audiences are demanding faster turnaround time and content development and content delivery. Um, we have a community of over 14 million Snapdragon insiders around the world. That's our fan community that we built over the past two years. We have to engage with them, you know, every kind of hour on the hour uh, to keep them engaged. So the demands are, are growing and there's only so many resources, human resources, that you have to work with from a creative studio perspective. So that's the way we're looking at deploying these AI tools and we're doing it in a very methodical and, and you know, heavy weight on governance and and we're, we have a whole AI steering committee at Qualcomm that, as you can imagine, consists of a bunch of lawyers, um, as well as representation from IT and finance and marketing, et cetera. And, and we deploy these tools in a very methodical way so that we make sure we understand how they're being trained. Uh, what kind of data are they using to train their models? Are they protected? Are they safe? Are they secure? We're, we're looking at what they've done in Europe with AI regulation, what we're, what we're gonna be facing here in the US, We've developed a set of AI principles in the deployment of these tools so that we can comply right, with, with that impending regulation here in the US, but the things that have already happened in Europe. So those are the types of things we think about as we deploy the tools, but the tools themselves have proven to be super helpful already. Um, and then the one thing you have to remember, at least from a marketing perspective, is a tool is just a tool. It, it's something that can help replace tasks. It's not really about replacing people or jobs. It's about making those jobs, you know, those people more productive. And once you replace those tasks, you still have to add that creative element, that ownership to whatever it is, the output that you're creating. And if you don't do that, then you can't own it at the end of the day. So, you know, AI requires human input. And then on the other side of the response that you might get from that tool, then you have to add that sort of secret sauce or that special element to uh, whether it's a image that you've created or whether it's copy that's been developed, you have to editorialize that copy. You have to make that content your own um, within your brand, or within the context of what you're trying to do and the audience you're trying to talk to. So those are really important things that you have to remember as you're deploying, if you're looking as an enterprise to deploy these AI tools, you have to think through that, you know, the, the spectrum of things um, that are important. But I really truly believe that these tools are going to be a game changer as far as my operating model as a CMO and how marketing will continue to deliver for the business going forward. Great, thank you. 
Um, a follow-on question for you, Don. What is Qualcomm's role in AI to enable businesses and industries? Well, as I said before, we're kind of a du mm -hmm. duality. So we've developed AI technology. We've been developing AI technology for the past 15 years. Um, and whether you may not realize it, but AI has probably been in multiple of your devices working in the background for probably the last 10 years. It's been making your photos better in your, in your smartphone. It's been making your audio sound better. Um, it's been working in the background, and you probably didn't even realize it. Um, that's because AI is a part of our Snapdragon platforms, and it's on 2.6 billion devices around the world today. Um, fast forward to the era of Gen AI, and, 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 and it's really Gen AI that's created the hype cycle around AI. Um, and it, but it's not a hype cycle in the same sense that the metaverse was a hype cycle, right? It's not going to fizzle out. It's here to stay, and it's just going to continue to evolve. And it's going to evolve faster than people can wrap their arms around it and their heads around it. Um, and so we just have to embrace that, that evolution. But, um, but we've been deploying, like I said, for 10 years. Our latest Snapdragon platforms have uh, AI capabilities where you can actually utilize Gen AI tools 100% on your device, and you don't even have to be connected to the cloud. Um, 10, 20, 30 billion parameters, large language models. I know I'm speaking tech speak here, I'm sorry. Um, but if you're familiar with ChatGPT, it's a large language model. If you're familiar with Stable Diffusion, large language model. Um, but you can, you can do, for, I'll give you an example. You can take the entire Alexa universe of what you may interact with Alexa, and you can do that on device today without any connectivity to the cloud. So um, on device and AI at the edge is kind of where we have our, you know, where we play. Um, yes, there is AI that goes to the cloud and to get a response, and then that, that cloud has to deliver the response back to the device, to the user. But in order for AI to scale, especially Gen AI to scale, it's going to have to be hybrid, right? A lot of the workloads are going to have to be done on device, at the edge, and in the cloud. There's privacy concerns, there's safety concerns, security, there's ownership of IP. Right? That's a, a lot of people are worried about uh, ownership of IP when it comes to AI. I mean, that's the basis of the writer strike and the actor strike was about maintaining ownership of my IP, my creativity, my writing, my image, my likeness. Um, and so those types of things are concerns. Well, with on-device AI or AI on-prem, meaning it's controlled by your private cloud, by your 5G private network, for example, or whatever that might be, you can lock down those data sets and you can train those models internally, and then you can utilize that data in a safe and secure environment. So that's the, the part of the Gen AI spectrum where Qualcomm really has its secret sauce. It's really, it's really at the edge and on device. Um, and it's gonna have to work that way across the device to the cloud because there are scalability issues, there are sustainability issues. Not every query can go to the cloud. It's 10 times more expensive for a Gen AI query on the data center than it is for a Google search. Who's gonna pay for that? Are you gonna pay for that? Um, so these things have to be figured out, and um, that's why a hybrid model is gonna be the reality of how AI is deployed. There's also water issues and power issues and things like that from an ESG perspective where there's not that many data centers in, 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 the, in the world that can handle that sort of volume. I mean, if you've ever used, if you've used Chat TV today, you will no doubtedly get, when you make a query, or prompts, you will get a response sometimes that says, come back later. Can't give you a response right now. That's because the data center is being over, overly taxed, right? Um, and so I think there was a story recently where Microsoft's data centers that were, that a lot of chat GPT activity were being sent to were using 30% more water on a monthly basis than they were before they started taking these prompts. Again, not sustainable. So. So that's where this, this hybrid AI approach is gonna be the way Gen AI really scales. The tools are gonna to be in the palm of your hand, and you're gonna be able to use those tools in a very confident way because you can lock it down. And then there's going to be stuff that has to go to the cloud. And it's just gonna be a mix of things because of latency and responsiveness. And AI right now, people are looking at Gen AI as a prompt and response, prompt and response. That's a good place to start. But in order for it to actually be ultimately effective for you as a user or for you as an enterprise, it's going to have it's going to have to be anticipatory. It's going to have to be suggestive, 
Over time, it's going to have to learn what you've allowed it to learn about you or your enterprise, and it's going to have to make proactive recommendations in order for it to be ultimately useful than just, I'm going to type something into a chat window, and then it's going to give me a set of responses, and sometimes they're going to be right, sometimes they're going to be wrong. Um, like I think ChatGPT told me I lived between 1792 and 1853. So, you know, um, so that's, that's accuracy, that's, there's a lot of things that unpack, um, but, but we're right at the center of it, you know, from a, on on-device and on-prem AI development perspective. It's an exciting time, um, and we're looking forward to what comes next. And you're going to see in 2024 a set of devices and a set of, of tools that are going to be launched with a lot of our partners that are going to bring amazing use cases on-device and, and on-prem to your world on a daily, hourly basis. So I'm really excited about the things we're headed to. Awesome, thank you. A uh, question for you as Qualcomm CMO, you're tasked with humanizing AI. Can you talk a little bit about how your marketing department might be delivering against those objectives? Sure, so one of the things that, um, when we're looking at talking and telling our AI story, it's really a horizontal story, and, it, and we have, I have uh, two sort of brands that I work with. I have the unique challenge and opportunity to work with the Snapdragon brand, which is more of our consumer-facing tech influencer, Brand. And then I have our, obviously the master brand, Qualcomm, which our storytelling is really focused on investors, regulators, B2B customers, or business decision makers, developers, and our ecosystem partners. And from an AI perspective, I'm doing, we're doing a lot on the Snapdragon side as it relates to our platforms. But from a Qualcomm perspective, horizontally we're looking at AI, and one of the, one of the biggest things that we noticed through our research was there's a fear, a lot of fear, right, of the unknown, of the way AI has been depicted in movies and the comments of Elon Musk and all these things going on, right? Where, you know, killer robots are coming down from Mars and they're going to take us all. Um, it, it doesn't have to be scary. Um, AI needs human interaction. It, it's going to do what we tell it to do. Uh, and so we set out to put a, a campaign together where the brief was really about humanizing AI. And of course, how do you humanize anything? The best thing to do is probably to use a human. Uh, so we actually uh, signed a three-year agreement with, with Michelle Yeoh. Michelle is an incredible person, uh, along with an incredible actor uh, and an accomplished um, thespian. And um, she is modern, she is evolved, she's kick-ass, um, and she's very tech-forward. So we, we, we actually um, signed a three-year collaboration with Michelle, and she's going to tell the humanizing AI story on our behalf. Chapter one was launched just this year. We're just into production now on chapter two. Now that the actor strike is over, we can get Michelle back in the studio and we can film chapter two. Um, I, the KPIs on the campaign have been phenomenal, especially with business decision makers and regulators, um, which are two of our target audiences. So really, really happy with that campaign. That's great, thank you. Question about how you're bridging technology with your F1 partnership. I'm, I'm curious what sets this apart from say your involvement in EPL or MLB or eSports, something unique about this. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, sure, so I, I, I mentioned that, you know, we have the Snapdragon brand, and you might you, you may see that around here at Vegas Grand Prix, especially as it, as it uh, is connected with the Mercedes F1 team. We have a, a five-year partnership that we just signed this beginning of the season with Mercedes, Patronus, AMG, Formula One, they need to shorten their name, uh, but, <laughs> Uh, it's, they're an amazing team, an amazing partner, um, and what we, what we look at broadly and from a macro perspective with brand partnerships is, and I really liked what my friends at T-Mobile, one of our great partners, uh, technology partners, um, it, it said about brand partnerships, our strategy, like their strategy, has evolved over time. As we started building more consumer awareness for Snapdragon, and, and just like T-Mobile is a, is a network, it's a service, it's, 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 it's not a thing that you buy, well, you can't buy a Snapdragon either, right? A Snapdragon is a little chip that sits on the pinky of your finger that has billions and billions of transistors that make the, de the device experiences that you experience on those little things called smartphones or PCs or XR devices or cars deliver amazing photos and amazing music uh, and amazing experiences, allow you to connect to an amazing network like T-Mobile through our modem technology. Um, and that little chip is so powerful. And, and I spent five and a half years at Intel, you know, during the height of the Intel Inside days. 
Um, and so that model of building an experience brand or an ingredient brand and having it resonate with an audience of consumers was brilliantly, brilliantly done by Intel for 25 years. Um, kind of sad, they kind of lost that a little bit, but, um, but I learned a lot there. And I learned about kind of how do, you, how do you do that? What's the recipe for success? And I've deployed that in more of a 2.0 way with Snapdragon because we have a broad, much broader opportunity than Intel had with the PC. Um, because our technology is so pervasive and Snapdragon goes into so many different devices um, across multiple categories. So when I'm thinking about brand partnerships, it's all based on experiences. And then those experiences are driven by people's passions. So we've organized our brand partnerships around passions. Photography, music, sports. Um, and, so, uh, and so we've entered into specific partnerships to exploit those passions, to drive more insider growth or community. Um, and to obviously drive top of funnel all the way down to bottom funnel metrics for, for Snapdragon and to support our partner ecosystem. We have great partners like Samsung and Xiaomi and Louis Vuitton and Mercedes and BMW and Cadillac and Meta, um, et cetera, et cetera. I get the opportunity to work with these amazing brands. So I wanted to work with them as well. So we have pass through rights that we've negotiated with most of our deals where we can bring our partners in to those deals. Um, specifically with F1, it's all about our automotive business, which has been exploding over the past five years, with like a $37 billion pipeline in automotive right now, where in every car, I don't care what the brand is, name a brand, Snapdragon is powering some part of your vehicle experience. Whether it's your connectivity, whether it's your dashboard, whether it's your digital displays in the back and the front, um, whether it's your driver's assistance, um, we're there. And so, a lot of automotive innovation starts with F1, believe it or not. So we thought it was really important for us to engage here with F1. And Mercedes, we've explored F1 a little bit. We've had other partnerships, um, short term, um, and uh, we decided to come back to Mercedes, who we had a previous partnership with a few years back, because um, you know we have some criteria about what we think partnership should be, and they just aligned with our values. Um, on innovation, tech forwardness, um, participation, and we really feel our partnerships is two-way. So it's what not only can you do to help build my brand, but what can my technology do for your enterprise, or your team, or your fans? And so that's how we look at our partnerships. And, and Mercedes embraced us like wholeheartedly. And when we sat down with Mercedes and we talked about our partnership, we talked about a lot of different aspects, and one thing Toto told me is, he said, look, I want to extend our fan experiences. And historically, and even today in Vegas, um, if you are lucky enough to be um, invited to a padded club of a team, whether it's Mercedes or Ferrari or McLaren or anybody else, um, there's only a certain amount of people that the padded club holds. And then if you are one of those lucky people, then you also get to possibly do a garage tour uh, over the course of the weekend. On average, Mercedes gets to bring probably 75 to 100 people through their garage tour on any race weekend. And what Toto really felt strongly about is he wanted to scale that experience to more people. Mercedes also does something um, unique, and I think they're the best at it, maybe I'm a little biased, is extending that VIP hospitality beyond the Silver Arrows Club into what's called the Mercedes Club. And of course in Miami it's called Miami Club, here in Vegas it's called the Vegas Club. If you've seen it, it's phenomenal, it's amazing. Um, and they're also doing it in Silverstone and possibly looking at Shanghai. Um, and so that, that hospitality usually holds between 600 and 1,500 people. So what Toto's idea was, I want to extend the VIP garage tour to the Vegas club and let the, the you know, 500 to 1,500 people that are going to be in that hospitality experience the garage because I can't bring them all through physically. So what we did is we teamed up. We used our Snapdragon platforms. We teamed up with Lenovo with their VR headset. We used one of our Snapdragon Spaces developer. Um, thank you, T-Mobile, for being a member of Snapdragon Spaces um, Alliance uh, called Trigger. And we built and recreated the Mercedes garage in VR. We volumetrically mapped the entire garage in Monza and Silverstone, the car, and Lewis Hamilton in London. And then Toto was a little mad that we didn't vol volumetrically like, recreate him. But he's, he's kind of live in the experience. 
and we built the Mercedes garage. And you can walk into the Vegas club, we have four different like little pods, and you can have from a five minute to a 30 minute immersive experience in the Mercedes garage. And Lewis Hamilton's your guide throughout the entire thing. Um, it looks amazing. Uh, our partner Trigger did an amazing job. And you really can't pull off any of these experiences, especially technology experiences, without partnership. It, you know, nobody does ever, anything on their own, right? Everybody has partners, and, and it takes a village to kind of pull these things off. So really an amazing group of people. Mercedes, so into it. Um, it's amazing in itself if you have a chance to get to the Vegas club, you know, scale a fence, whatever, climb in. Um, or you know, maybe see me after, and I might be able to, to get you in to see it. Uh, it's an amazing experience. We're already talking about version 2.0, right, for, um, for, for Miami uh, for next year and for Shanghai. So um, new ideas already popping in people's heads about how we can even make it better. So that's how we're bringing our partnership to life through our technology, enhancing the fan experience for Mercedes. And if it scales to 1,500, you know, we're, we're asking ourselves the question, where can it go next? How, how broad can we really make this um, to all those you know, Mercedes F1 fans around the world, digitally, virtually, um, et cetera? Can we take it on the road outside of a race, bring it to different events, bring it to South By, you know, bring it to Art Basel, right? bring it to Web Summit, whatever that might be. So we're looking at those types of things. That's great, thank you, very cool. How about we open it up for some questions? Sure. Hi, uh, Oli from Stereo, we're a creative agency. Um, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about how generative AI is progressing. At the moment, it's prompt response, prompt response. Um, and it, it totally makes sense that it gets to that point of making recommendations to suggestive parts of this. The part of that that scares me a little bit, though, from a creative perspective and a marketing perspective, is I worry that that takes away some of the the whole point of what you were saying, which is you need the person to say, well, that is, that's a fucking good idea. Um, and instead it's the AI telling you that that's a good idea. Does that, do you worry about that? Do you think that takes away some of the agency and the kind of that ability to know what true great originality looks like? Well, I think, you know, in the, in the, the art of creation starts with ideation. And I think that when, when you're in that ideation phase, I think Genetvaya can be very helpful to kickstart ideation. Um, and then you, as a human or as a team of people, of creators, whether individually or in a group, um, have to decide when whatever Gen AI has done to help you, you're done, right? And you're gonna take it from here. Um, whether it's in a collaborative environment or whether it's individually, you've got what you needed. You know, people get stuck, right? Get stuck, sorry, rather. There's a thing called writer's block for a reason, right? People get stuck. And the creative process sometimes takes a long time. You know, creatives are lovely people. Mr. DeLuca, to my right here. And so, but it, it, there, there is things that interrupt, disrupt the creative process. The brain works uniquely. Um, there are other concerns, there are distractions. If you can use Gen AI to help kind of put you on a path. And then once it gets you on that path, say, okay, I'm going to take it from here. That's where you add that secret sauce, that creativity, that element, that ownership. And then I think the out ultimate outcome can be and oftentimes so much better from that ideation phase. You can also accelerate volume-wise the amount of content you can produce and, and, and through the creative process by kind of kickstarting. We use Writer right now in the product naming process. If any of you have had to name products before, it is a royal pain in the ass. First of all, you have to come up with names. Names that people like, names that are relevant, names that you can trademark. Then you have to go to a search, you have to do a knockout search, and you have to say, is this available globally? Oh no, someone's trademarked this in Botswana. You can't use it in Botswana. Damn it. So, you know, so Gen AI, Writer, has been a phenomenal tool and we brought in JDI tools where we can do knockout searches in seconds. That used to take our legal department four weeks just to do a knockout search. And we were all excited about a name, like, you got it, we've nailed it. And our legal came back and said, no, these four countries can't use it. Back to the drawing board, gotta pick another name. So these Gen AI tools for specifically for that, and that is a creative process. Creative isn't just pretty pictures and fancy videos. Creative process, you know, everybody's creative and creation is just an act of making something. 
So um, we are, we're finding amazing capabilities and amazing results from how we use the tools. But again, it's all about like pragmatic approach to how you use the tools. Democratization without structure is chaos. So you have to have structure, you have to have governance, and you have to have a set of principles that are gonna guide how you use these tools. And if you do that, I think, just like with anything, you know, it's gonna be okay. Maybe I'm an optimist. I have a quick question for, uh, uh, for her. You guys are the leaders in sort of sponsorship measurement and knowing where dollars flow across, in particular, the sports industry. How would you put how do you see Formula One going forward vis-a-vis -vis other major sports like football, et cetera? How do you look at that, that, that whole area? Thank you for the question. So motorsports, and in particular Formula One, is growing exponentially versus other traditional sports. So I think we saw something like a 40% lift in sponsorships in that category year over year, with technology as the main driver of that. So we're bullish on it, and we you know track metrics, of course, across, you know, thousand different data points around us and so absolutely believe that the future is here and if you can tell a story like Qualcomm is telling it really just humanizes that experience for customers and think of the Lewis Hamilton experience you're basically the closest you can get to riding with him in the car it's super cool thanks for the question if you haven't checked out the tool it's amazing sorry a little PSA for sponsor United it's, a, it's an amazing tool thank you Don and Eric Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.